Welcome everyone uh, to this uh, installation lecture. I'm Johan Tysk, the, the Dean of the Faculty of Science and Technology. Uh, last week, we all uh, enjoyed the professor in, in installations uh, university-wide, and uh, somehow we continue with yet another installation lecture today. Uh, and this uh, installation lecture is on climate change leadership, and this professorship is a little different from the other professorships at the university. This professorship is financed by Sandstrom Philanthropies, and we have Niklas Sandstrom here in the audience. He is an alum of Uppsala University, studied engineering, physics, and economics, I believe. And of course, the, the university is grateful for this gift from uh, Sandstrom Philanthropies. And uh, uh, let me also then say something about the, the holder of the Sandstrom Professorship in Climate Change Leadership, uh, Sverker Jagers. Uh, Sverker is a political scientist, but a political scientist looking on, uh, considering the dynamics of, of control. How do you change opinion? How do you change popular opinion? How do you what are the different, what are the important people who lead at different activities? Do you need to involve politicians, uh, civil rights groups, groups of people, political parties? Uh, what kind of organizations, what kind of leadership is required for different changes in society? And I think we'll hear a very interesting lecture on his theories and ideas in the field of climate change leadership. So an applause to the new climate change leadership professor, Sverke Jagers. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming, despite the weather and all. Uh, I'm very honored and I'm grateful for both this position and uh, to be here to be able to say something about my thoughts on, on climate leadership, which I think makes more sense than climate change leadership, but we can discuss that for the future. <laughs> so um, uh, I will try to say way too many things in way too little time. Um, so, um, but I, at least I will give you a broad overview on, on how I look at climate leadership and indications of what I do in my specific research. Uh, so some kind of mix, if I manage to. Uh -huh. Yes. <clears throat> so. I will start by, by uh, very quickly just explain why I think we allow climate change to happen. Uh, what is needed to avoid it. And uh, also say something about my own perspective on how these problems should be studied uh, to a larger extent than it's happening today. And in case you haven't figured out what I'm interested in by, by then, I will give you a very quick review of, of what I do in my daily research life. But let me start here. So uh, this comes as no surprise to anyone. The, the temperature is increasing, the emissions of greenhouse gases are increasing over time, uh, leading to climate change. Uh, so this is not surprising. And we also know that along the way, uh, several important conferences have been held, several important decisions and agreements have been signed. And still, uh, the curve is way too steep upwards. And uh, I think it's interesting to, to uh, ask why this is happening. How come that, regardless of all these fancy agreements, we see no progress whatsoever? 
and uh, I think we are we are stuck or trapped in inertia in society. And uh, uh, climate change is is not unique here at all. To me, I see climate change as one one example of a tendency that we see everywhere in society, basically, not the least related to the environment. So uh, you have the same curves, the same development for, for uh, uh, fishing, for deforestation, for antibiotic resistance that is increasing gradually. Uh, but also uh, a tendency that we cheat with taxes and we uh, overuse subsidies when we have the chance. The way I look at this, it's basically the same problem, all of those. And it's not only that we see it in, in these global challenges. We even see it in, in, in our daily, daily life. This is my favorite example, or one of them at least. Uh, so many of us have shared a laundry room with others. And uh, in the end of, of the evening, when we pick up the, 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 our laundry from the tumble dryer, it's so easy to, to leave the, this little fluff in the filter, hoping that someone else will pick it up the morning after. And usually someone does. And the worst thing that can happen is that there is an angry note in the, in the stair hall saying that you who didn't remove the fluff, don't do that, or I get really angry. Well, what if everyone leaves the fluff in the tumble dryer? Then eventually the machine will start burning and we all end up having to dry our laundry in the living room. So this little short-term benefit of leaving the fluff in the tumble dryer leads to a collective disaster for all, all of us. To me, this is exactly the same thing as climate change or overfishing or whatever you like, cheating with taxes or corruption. Uh, let me explain how I think. Well, first of all, what we need to do is to go from this inertia to some kind of action. And I think leadership is necessary for that traveling from inertia to action. And I think a key to get to action is by thinking in terms of collective action. So let me say something. I know some in the room are now smiling because this is really what I, this is my sort of main interest. So uh, usually a collective action problem is defined as a social dilemma. And the social dilemma is uh, a dilemma between two different options that we have. So if I, if I, uh, yeah, if I use the tumble dryer or something, I always benefit more by leaving the fluff in the tumble dryer than pick it out. I make a small time gain from that. Or if I fish in the Baltic Ocean, I always gain more by, by fishing as much as I can. Nothing will happen really. I, I can't fish up all cod that used to be in the, the Baltic Sea. <clears throat> And I definitely earn more by doing that compared to if I come to an agreement together with everyone else. How much fish should we catch in order for the fish stock to sustain over time and for us to earn as much as possible? So I should go for self-interest in order to, to gain as much as possible. The problem is that if we all do this, we actually gain less by acting in self-interest compared to if we had instead uh, agreed and, and started to, to cooperate or to act collectively. <clears throat> so of course we, we would like everyone to, to uh, come to an agreement, but who should start? Who should start fishing less? Or who should start being the one who take out the, the fluff in the tumble dryer? 
this is the really tricky thing. And I think the inertia is very much exactly there in taking the first step. Because on the one hand, we have a lot to win, of course. Well, yeah, win a lot by, by acting in self-interest. And we, but also, if we decide to change behavior, behavior, we have a great risk of be, becoming a loser. If I am the only one who buy a smaller fishing boat or fishing vessel and fish fewer hours in the Baltic, I will gain less. But in case no one else is changing the behavior, the fish will disappear anyway, but maybe half an hour later than if I hadn't changed my behavior. And then I become a double loser or a double sucker that the literature talk about. Because then I earn less, lesser in the short term and the resource disappear anyway. So how do we get actors, whether it's individuals or corporates or states or whatever you like, who use resources to take that step? To do that, we need some guarantees that others will change behavior too. And how, how do we get these guarantees? Now, I'm not the first to say this. In fact, there are three Nobel Prizes in economics over the years uh, that has been concerned with exactly this dilemma situation. And the most recent prize uh, was given to Eleanor Ostrom, who have researched this uh, topic for over 50 years, identifying a number of facilitators or factors that facilitate corporate, cooperative behavior to, to facilitate collective action. So if we read her, we get a clue on how to overcome these collective action problems, how we can get actors to, 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 uh, uh, to cooperate when they shouldn't according to theory at least. And uh, I just, it's, uh, oh, I will not go through this at all, but things like if we trust in each other, if I trust others to change behavior, that is a, a good facilitator that can encourage me to, to, to change behavior. If we manage to develop social norms between us, that's another factor that can increase propensity for collective action. If we have possibilities to communicate with each other, if the actors are homogeneous and so forth. A number of, of factors that are beneficial for cooperation. Now, the problem is that most of this research has been done either in the lab, four, six students in every group, sometimes only two, based on game theory, developed and testing various uh, uh, situ uh, cooperation situations. Or by studying small case, uh, cases out in the real world, going to the small fishing village and see under what conditions they can change behavior or they have already changed behavior. <clears throat> what I'm interested in, in and my research group and many others with us is what about the large scale situations? When, when maybe even the dilemma situation is not as, as apparent as in the small scale situation. So basically, can we take Ostrom's findings and apply it on climate change or antibiotic resistance? Well, uh, this we have pondered upon quite a lot in the group. Uh, and uh, we argue that when you scale up, a lot of things happens. And the first thing that happens is that the dilemma situation is no longer a dilemma. The social dilemma gradually uh, 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 evaporates and turns into a coordination problem. So you still need cooperation, but not necessarily for exactly the same reasons as in the small scale, where if everyone uh, who act in self-interest are eventually punished equally much. Uh, the larger the scale, the more likely that some people or some actors have more resources than others, for example, 
So, so it's a huge difference between being a fisherman in the Baltic, completely dependent on fishing, compared to someone who also has an education in engineering or who has inherited a lot of money. If the di fish disappear for them, they can do something else. And of course, on a global scale, this becomes even more apparent that there are lots of asymmetries that follows with, with scale. So in common for both social dilemmas and coordination problems is that you need collective action to overcome the problem and some need to change or, or act not according to the self-interest in order for the problem to be overcome, but not necessarily everyone. And this makes things even more complicated. Uh, so when we scale up, uh, there are th four things that happens. And this happens uh, differently depending on problem. But in most cases, the number of actors are increasing. The spatial distance between the actors are increasing. For some large scale collective action problems, the tem temporal distance also increases where climate change is a good example. It's not primarily those who are emitting today that will, uh, that will suffer from the consequences. It's rather future generations, not even yet born. And for several problems, also complexity increases. These four characteristics, I argue, and we argue, uh, give, generates various stressors that hampers the facilitators that Ostrom and others have identified. So the larger the scale, the more actors become anonymous to each other the more heterogeneous actors become, the more social and economic distance develops between uh, and between and in, be in between uh, those who contribute to the problem and are affected by the problem and so forth. Yes. So the conclusion that we, we have drawn and I think it's, it makes a lot of sense, is that the larger the scale of a collective action problem, the less likely that an individual actor will change behavior spontaneously and voluntarily. Because there are so many, due to these stressors, there are so many factors speaking against the probability that others will also change behavior. And unless you are extremely morally guided that this is the only right thing to do regardless what others do then you probably change behavior but for most of us we are only conditional cooperators we co cooperate given certain things and one of these things is that there are some kind of guarantees that others will also change behavior this leads then to the conclusion that in order to get actors to make these necessary behavioral changes, help is needed. We need some kind of external force or at least someone taking leadership, helping us to cooperate where we have few propensities to do this voluntarily. And I think this leadership can be taken by many uh, different actors in society. Political leadership, of course, and that's maybe the most natural leader because the, 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 the toolbox of, of the government or the political system is so much more diverse and extensive compared to all other leaders. You have everything from military power to carbon taxes that you can use as a government. Uh, but this is not to say that there aren't other leaders or leadership as well. We, over the lunch, we talked about scientific leadership, which I think can serve as a very important example. Where one thing when it comes to climate change is to defend scientific findings. Uh, these findings are constantly threatened from various sources, and this needs to be defended. It could take the, the shape of activism or applied research that I will talk about in the end. 
but also there is business leadership that can and need to be taken. And that's both between corporates. So, so again, over the lunch, we talked about potential co cooperative collective action in value chains. That those who are upstream a value chain need guarantees downstream that their products will be demanded if they produce it and vice versa. It's impossible for Volvo to promise to deliver carbon dioxide free cars by 2030 unless SSRB can deliver uh, 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 fossil free steel to them. And in between, there are lots of agreements and collective action that is needed. But you also need collective action within a company. And especially the larger they become, the more complex they are and the more difficult to, to, to create engagement. And civil society, media leadership, and perhaps also individual leadership. I still have 10 minutes, right? Yes. I, my, I focus in my research on political leadership uh, <clears throat> and how politics can can avoid various problems to, to, to uh, occur. Uh, much of this research, when it comes to say, uh, policy instruments, uh, have been concerned with effectiveness. We want as effective policy instruments or politics as possible. And then, uh, and that's of course reasonable. The, the, the more powerful, the, the better for the environment. But given that we have other interests in society than the environment, uh, for example, we want uh, policies to be cost efficient as well. These th aspects need to be considered too. We want to pick the most low hanging fruit. And I would say that until quite recently, surprisingly recently, these two aspects have mainly guided the development of environmental policy instruments, not only related to the climate, but in general. Disregarding the fact that we have a risk of always ending up in yellow vest moments, if we only go for effectiveness and cost efficiency. But unless political preconditions are considered too, where one important thing is for, uh, acceptance for policies and policy instruments. There will be no policy at all, unless you, you are ready to, to live with yellow vest movements and things. So politicians, don't, they don't dare to, to implement the most effective and the, the most cost efficient policies. And this is a reason why we know since 1930 that a, a, an environmental tax is a super great policy instrument for changing behavior, for taking climate or environmental leadership, increasing the price and that will eventually change behavior. Still, and uh, still in 2022, there are only 10, 11 countries in the world who has a carbon dioxide tax. We have had one since 30 years ago and a few other countries. And this is because it's impossible to implement them the way they have been suggested by economists. They are cost efficient, yes, but unacceptable. So <clears throat> I think policies and political leadership need to be concerned with designing and developing and implementing feasible policies. That may be second best solutions, but it, at least they are implementable. And it's much better to have a second best solution implemented than a, a, a first best solution only being up in the air or being in theory. So much of my research has been on trying to focus on political preconditions and to develop policies that can be considered acceptable among those who are affected. And there are numerous of factors that affect uh, acceptance of policies. Psychological factors like values, beliefs, norms, interpersonal and institutional factors like social trust in between actors, but also trust in the 
authorities implementing policies and so forth. But also factors related to the actual policy instruments. Things like whether they're considered fair or not, effective or not, if they affect my personal freedom or not, and also numerous of socio-demographic factors like gender, income, and so forth. You may wonder which, which ones are the most important then. So uh, we did a, a recent meta-analysis of all these factors for as many studies that we could find. And it turns out that fairness and effectiveness are by far, by far the strongest determinants for whether someone will accept a climate policy instrument or not. Followed by beliefs about the state of the climate. So the more worried you are about the climate, the more likely that you will support a climate policy instrument, which is not so strange. But fairness and effectiveness, they are even more important. And these factors can actually be used when designing policy instruments. You can, yeah, let's say that you implement a, a, a climate tax on behavior. That will have a negative income effect on many people, but that can be compensated for. So you combine the tax with a dividend or a compensation scheme of some kind, basically paying back the money again. Then some of the steering effect will disappear because if you get say 10,000 kroner back in the end of the year, you probably fill up the car once. But most people will not buy gasoline for all the 10,000 kroner they get back in the end of the year. They will use it for shampoo, for oranges and whatever, because a household economy is a complex thing and, and the costs are, constitutes many different things. So this is what I think research sh should be much more about, trying to develop policy instruments that are feasible. Now, what do you see here? Or here? Well, where? There. Now it comes. What do we see here? We see poor children. We see poverty. We see all sorts of uh, misery out in the world. And here is my last take on social science. When I go to social science conferences, or I read the most prominent uh, journals in many social sciences, including political science, some articles and some studies are about these things. But what do you think they ask this empirical observation? They ask things like, is this justifiable, what we see out there? Of course it's not. They see uh, cases. They select cases of poor children in different regions of the world that they can compare in order to develop social science theory. We see studies uh, picking these cases in order to uh, explain these terrible things that we see out there. If we want social science to help policy making in making the world a bit better. Which one would you pick of these three? Exactly. So what I'm calling for and what I would like to contribute with during my time as, a uh, as not as a lecturer, but <laughs> as a professor even, is trying to convince colleagues and friends and society in general that we need to be brave enough to, uh, it's, it's a delay here. My whole pedagogic point just disappears. We must be better at asking how can these terrible things be avoided based on our theories? How can we use our theories to see and ask how can we make the world a little bit better? I don't say that we shouldn't, that we should disregard the other things. Absolutely not. But it needs to have a value 
also to to apply social science and see how can we use our theories to to design policies and policy measures that can help us avoiding these terrible things. And uh, if you wonder who I am, this is pretty much what I've tried to do in my career. Uh, it's not to show off, show off. It's just a uh, oh, terrible machine. I should have been an engineer. Yeah, uh, my point, it should all have popped up. Uh, yes, I, I think it's worthwhile using social science and apply it more. And uh, I hope to do that here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Sverker. We have now about um, 10 minutes for Q&A session. Uh, after that, we'll take a leg stretcher and invite the panel up here. But first, we open up for any questions that you might have on what Sverker brought up. Uh, and since we are sending this over Zoom as well, welcome all of you. Uh, we have a chat function for questions as well that we will try to keep an eye on. Uh, but also those of you who ask questions here in the audience, you need to use the microphones. Um, so we have some people there, yeah, strange microphones. So anyone, we have one up there. Let's take two questions at the same time and see if our new visiting professor can track of them. And please introduce yourself also. So, you thank you. I'm Anna Rutgersson, professor of metrology here at Uppsala University. So, uh, interesting. I wonder, there are good examples of successful um, um, global scale environmental things that have been solved. I'm thinking, for example, for the ozone hole and the freons that damage the ozone hole, which has partly been uh, solved and, and the solution was found. And so how do these things fit into your theories? Excellently. <laughs> uh, no, um, yes, it is a good example. Uh, and, and maybe one of the re most recent successful, really international examples of, of large scale collective action. And I think that it was particularly easy to solve. Uh, both psychologically and also uh, uh, sort of technologically. So one thing was, it was so obvious that we are affected here and now. People got skin cancer and, 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 and the metaphor of a hole, an ozone hole, was really, really effectful for people to realize how vulnerable we are to, to, to the sun. Uh, that, so that's one thing. It was, it was easy to communicate this problem. The second thing was that there were already alternatives uh, to CFCs that could be used instead. And uh, by coincidence, this, this was all, also an, a substance that was owned by, by one of the most powerful of the, the companies providing uh, freeze materials. So, so uh, uh, this was a relatively easy problem to solve compared to transforming the whole energy system, the global energy system from fossil fuels to alternatives. Uh, but I think we can learn and, and studies have tried to learn from this case, but it's easy, difficult because it's a very different type of collective action problem, although the base, the same core problem, the core problem is the same. Thank you. And maybe if I may, Compliment, Mikael Carlson. I'm head of the climate change leadership unit. Uh, since we have some uh, uh, scholars in environmental law here, I think also that uh, one of the mechanisms behind in that case was also the fact that there were double norms uh, where so-called industrialized countries moved ahead 10 years mm -hmm. ahead of others, as well as transferred resources uh, for using these existing alternatives. It was important to, to build trust in the international negotiations. Um, we had one more question here. Uh, 
Okay, my name is Mike Yanov. I'm a professor and I'm a solar cell researcher. Mm. Uh, and and uh, I'm wondering about the, what you said about the, the lack of information. Uh, how can we how can we do uh, transform the lack of information to lack of knowledge and then fill the knowledge gap and not the information gap? I I struggle a lot with explaining the electricity crisis. Yeah. The information is there, but not the knowledge. How do we do it? Well, uh, the thing is, I don't think that's the kind of information that is required. I think there is generally a rather high awareness of the problems surrounding us. Uh, and uh, it's more about the commu communication, what others do. It's, it's related to this guarantee that if I know that others will change behavior too, I'm more likely to do it myself. And I'm more fine in being steered in the same direction compared to being the first to change. Um, so so uh, knowledge in this meta-analysis, for example, uh, it's very clear that knowledge and information is one of the absolutely weakest determinants for behavioral change um, compared to if you are worried or if you find that the suggested policies are considered fair or not. So, so uh, don't spend too much efforts on communicating on solar cells. And I can, we can discuss what you should focus on instead. <laughs> Great, thank you. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. We have one more question here, but I would also like to, to ask you, Sarki, when you talk about uh, acceptance and uh, perceived fairness, um, who is actually being responsible responsible for setting the agenda about what is acceptable and not. You said that it's difficult for politicians to impose a tax or a law if if it's not perceived fair. But hypothetically, wouldn't it be the political leaders themselves that are actually setting the agenda for what is considered to be fair or not? So I mean, they are those sort of. Uh, developing their markets, so to say, or not. Yeah, that's a good point. <clears throat> Politicians are only humans. And uh, I think it's a huge pedagogical challenge in explaining not only uh, the pros and cons with one specific policy, but uh, also to compare the pros and cons with one policy compared to another policy. So if we do studies on the public opinion about climate change politics, then carbon dioxide taxes are always the least popular ones compared to subsidies to green fuels or uh, expanding uh, public transport or subsidizing uh, uh, insulated uh, windows or whatever. So then it's easy to draw the conclusion that, well, then taxes is not a, 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 a good way forward. The thing is, if we then subsidize fuels instead, then everyone has to pay the cost. Not only those who are, are uh, uh, emitting, but also those who have actively taking the bicycle instead. And if we ask people what they think about polluter pays principle compared to everyone have to pay principle regardless of responsibility or not, then polluter pays principle is much more in, uh, popular. And finally, then, then the victim pays principle. Then the victim pays principle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And finally, if we ask what people think about the carbon dioxide tax compared to all other taxes we pay, including the ones we have to increase in order to finance subsidies of green fuels or extending public transport, then the carbon dioxide tax is one of the most popular taxes. And to me, this is a clear signal. As a politician to sell in a policy, you need to have the necessary tools and arguments and explain what are the options given that we want to deal with climate change? Thank you. We have a question from the uh, chat, have, and then, and then uh, I think we have two more here. But then we will come back also after the panel. But, so that one, and 
two here. Yes. Yes, great. Um, we've got a question from someone in the chat. Uh, Anne Katrine Peters would like to hear a little bit more about the activism in science from you. Uh, why was there a question mark behind the word? And then there's a smiley face. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> because uh, the other two, the other two uh, suggestions there, defending science and sort of contributing with applied findings uh, are relatively sort of unproblematic, I would say. Uh, as a scientist, I can do these things without sort of, especially as a political scientist, it's very difficult to study politics and be part of politics, but th because then I'm always risking to be uh, 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 accused for mixing with my empirics, which I think might be true even. So therefore, all political scientists who are also involved in a political party is always S-marked or M-marked, and no, they are not published at all, uh, other than in, in, in newspapers. Because it's, it's impossible to keep your, your scientific legitimacy in relation to the to the, the public. That's less difficult for someone who studied natural science, I think. But for social sciences, this is a very difficult act of balance. And therefore I put the question mark. You have you have to be ready to pay a pretty high price if you do that. Yes. Thank you. So Daniel, uh, question there and one more. Let's take both of them before you respond. Sure. Yeah, and mine, yes. you've already answered. So I was wondering about the activism in science, because to me, that doesn't necessarily have to be under the heading of science. But I don't think you need to dwell no. more on it. So yeah, we can elaborate on that. Yes, for sure. Okay. <clears throat> Very convenient, Mike. <laughs> All right. Uh, my name is Lars Rudebeck. I'm a political scientist as well. Nice. And, uh, but, well, li listening to you, it sounds a little bit as if um, all actors involved all have the same interest in resolving the climate crisis. But in, in actual fact, I, I don't think that is true. Some actors have less interest in resolving it immediately than in gaining power, for instance, or maintaining power they have, or conquering <laughs> neighboring countries, what have you. People, actors have many different interests and often conflicting interests. And sometimes actors uh, who are less interested in dealing with climate crisis immediately have much more power <laughs> than those who are more interested. So where does the problem of political power come into your arguing? Yep. Excellent question. Thank you for this. Um, so it comes in under the heading, uh, uh, the subtitle I had with social and economic uh, asymmetries. Mm -hmm. So it's you are absolutely right that many actors are actually gaining either from being the last to change behavior or even gaining from climate change. And of course, the more powerful they are, the more of a barrier they will, and stressor they will be for the generation of, of collective action. And uh, if, if we had been on my master program, we would have talked a lot about power, uh, but now I only had half an hour, but you're absolutely right. There are lots of stressors out there that work, uh, that hampers uh, the collective action facilitators, for sure. Thank you very much. So I think we should uh, thank uh, Sverke again with an applaud before we take a leg stretcher and move to the panel. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, please don't leave the room unless you really have to, but two, three minutes leg stretch, and I would like to ask the panelists to come up here and then we will continue with, with their comments and open for questions again, and then Sverke will reflect in the end. Oh. <laughs> 